Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to another episode of Hale State Debate. Uh, it is November 2020, we are in the midst of a global pandemic, uh, but that is not stopping us from debating. We're doing it online, but still doing it nonetheless. And for uh, Lincoln Douglas in November, December of this year, I think we have a, a really good, like deceptively good topic, which is resolve the United States ought to provide a federal jobs guarantee. So that's what we're gonna be covering today. Um, you may have noticed we got a new friend with us. Uh, you haven't met him yet, uh, but this is Normal Bot, one of our very best debaters here at MSU. A great guy. We've known him for a long time. Hopefully, he'll be a good friend to you too as you learn more about Lincoln Douglas. So, Normal, welcome. Thank you very much for having me on, Brett. Glad to always make more friends and be YouTube famous. Yeah, YouTube famous is a big deal. You're going to be seen by literally like five to seven thousand people, like one tenth of one percent of what a cat video would get. But still, hey, it's, it's useful to people and they like it. So everybody, welcome to Normal. Um, and so a, a few real quick announcements before we get started. Number one, uh, as always, we want this to be helpful to you. So if it is, maybe like, maybe subscribe, maybe tell a friend. If it's not useful, if it's terrible, maybe tell an enemy. Uh, follow us on Twitter at Hell State Debate for kind of our musings and thoughts on life in general and about debate. Uh, and of course, as always, the links and timestamps are in the notes below. Um, so make use of those. The reason we put them there is so that you can do your own, you know, original research with them. That's a lot more useful to you in growing as a debater than just like listening to what we tell you. And as a quick aside, we are not sponsored by any company, including Omen Gaming Laptops, <laughs> although they, in my opinion, are very good. Yeah, we've had like a lot of stuff on the broadcast in the past, like Taco Bell, Mountain Dew and stuff. We have to explain like just because we have it on the table, <laughs> nobody is sponsoring us. Nobody's giving us any money, but that's true here too. So. Um, so anyway, just getting to a few general thoughts before we kind of kick it off in earnest. Um, first of all, I think it's a really good topic. Like, I'm, I'm surprised at how much I like it. It's deceptively good. I think it's a broad topic with a lot of different avenues that you can take depending on what your preferences are. So number one is economics, as we'll talk about in just a minute. I, I think a good understanding of like labor economics and things like that, macroeconomic theory will help you. Number two is pure value philosophy. You know, you can definitely come at this as like a pure utilitarian cost benefit analysis thing but there's also some philosophical nuances about like the value of work and the value of human dignity and things like that that I think will be interesting avenues critical avenues that you can take um, and then policy I mean you know obviously this is a policy proposal straight up it's a policy resolution and there are different proposals you can look at and they have different cost benefit trade-offs right so just briefly talking about those three when we talk about economics as we're going to get into later when we do sort of an overview of the of the of the resolution you're really going to need to take some time to understand the basics of like Keynesian economic stimulus theory and how like we, we do government spending in order to stimulate an economy that's in a recession and that has a good effect which is it brings people out of the unemployed pool and gets them working and things like that but the other side of that coin is and, and this is a really important part of a federal jobs guarantee when when things are too good the government begins to pull back on the stimulus right we stop stimulating as much and we expect to have the economy slow down to avoid the problem of inflation, which is another thing we're going to talk about later. And at the end of the day, what that ends up doing is it drives more people back into the pool of the unemployed. And so while it's a little bit complicated and while it will take a minute to explain, we have really for centuries, uh, not just in the United States, but every developed economy in the world, used unemployment as kind of like a pressure release valve when we regulate the economy, when we go from the cycle of boom and bust, we expect to have more people go back to being unemployed. And one of the theories behind the jobs guarantee is maybe instead of having a massive pool of unemployed people, we should instead try to sort of flip the script and have a massive pool of employed people. And that has major economic consequences and it, it provides for a lot of depth if you really want to understand it, but it is something that we're going to have to talk about later. So there's that economic aspect of it, right? There's also the philosophical aspect, which again, you can look at utilitarianism, but you can also look at philosophers all the way from Aristotle to Karl Marx to critical theorists that are working today who talk about things like the dignity of work and the value of work and the inherent sort of uh, importance of work to our worth as human beings or, or whether or not maybe that's, that's a bad idea to link our worth to, to the labor that we do. Uh, so a really deep body of literature there. And then lastly, on the policy side, there's multiple policies. We're going to look at at least a couple of major proposals that, that you could potentially advocate for. So anyway, just a lot of depth there. Um, a lot to prepare for. This is one where you're going to have to put in the work, right? You're going to have to put in the time to do the research and understand a wide variety of things. And you're also going to have to understand, as we always say, how to tell the story to the judge, right? In other words, you're going to get into these complicated rounds where economics 
and statistics are being thrown around and you're really going to have to be able to, for example, say, hey, if you're going to argue that a jobs guarantee is better at regulating the economy, you've got to tell the judge in plain language how that works, right? And that's going to make you better off on this. So Nirmal, what thoughts do you have on the topic? So I definitely think that this is a very good topic because as we've already talked about, it covers a broad spectrum of topics that allows us to kind of delve into each and every side and aspect of this resolution. I'd also like to talk about how there is a good bit of history that we see with this topic. You know, this idea of providing jobs to everyone started off with Roosevelt and his idea of providing economic security to all. Uh, as he showed in this programs such as the Works Progress Administration and the Civilian Conservation Corps, we saw that he attempted to have something similar, although it was for a very, very short term, and it was nowhere near the scale of what the resolution today is talking about. However, we'll see that many of the same concepts that apply to those programs are going to be transferring over to the topic that we're talking about today. Yeah, I mean, again, I think it's just a deceptively deep topic. If you just go looking and Googling around, you're going to find a lot of articles from the last couple of years, and you're going to think this is just something we made up out of thin air, you know, or something that only matters in like the last three or four years since a few people started proposing it. But the truth is, it has links to economic and theoretical and policy ideas that go a long way back. And the debaters who do really well are going to be the ones that take the time to understand it. So uh, with that, we're going to do what we usually do, which is try to keep this organized for you. So uh, the first thing we're going to look at is some definitions, then move on to values and criteria. Then before we get to the major arguments, we're going to take a segment and talk a little bit about just overviewing some concepts, some of the economic stuff, some of the proposals, just to make sure we're all speaking the same language. Then we'll do the affirmative arguments, then we'll do the negative arguments. So with that, and with no further ado, let's jump right into it with some definitions. Okay, so on definitions, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of fighting over the details of definitions on this one, but there's always going to be a few things, a few opportunities to be squirrely. So let's just work through them really quickly to make sure we're all on the same page. So the first one is the United States, and in most rounds this is going to be a given. It's going to be that we're talking about the United States federal government. Now, you know, occasionally on some resolutions people do try to get a little clever with this, and they try to argue, for example, that you know the United States should be the, the separate 50 states. In other words, each individual state ought to run it, uh, or maybe run a counter plan to that effect. On this resolution, I don't think uh, you know I don't think that that's going to be a big issue or a big question because the resolution makes it clear that this is a federal jobs guarantee, right? So there's only one actor in the world that can do this, and that is the United States federal government. And there's also practical reasons why you'd want to do this on a federal level as opposed to having states compete against each other with different jobs guarantees. So I guess in theory maybe um, maybe a, a negative could run what you call a 50 states counter plan and say each state ought to do it, but that to me would be a really bad idea. I think you'd see things like a race to the bottom where you know states would want to pay as little as possible to, to pawn their unemployed off on their neighbors. Mississippi would want to pay as little as possible so they would go to Alabama and that sort of thing. So I don't think you're going to see a lot of creativity with the United States. Uh, ought is uh, a perennial subject of contention in Lincoln Douglas uh, definitions. You know, there's always the question of, of whether ought implies can. Uh, you know, this is an idea from Immanuel Kant. I don't think it's such a big idea here. I mean, obviously, a federal uh, jobs guarantee would be a massive undertaking. It would cost billions of dollars. But, you know, I don't think anyone would argue that it literally cannot be done. Right? Other countries have done similar things. The United States, as you mentioned with the Works Progress Administration, has made similar efforts in the past. The estimates are that we're talking about you know, $500 billion or whatever. Again, a huge amount of money, but no one would suggest that it's impossible. The other issue on ought that sometimes people use is the, the idea that ought means a moral obligation. And that from that, what they often derive as debaters is because it's a moral question, because all it refers to morality, then I shouldn't have to consider, like as the affirmative, how it would happen. I shouldn't have to advocate for the details. It's just a moral question. To me, I've never heard a good explanation of like why that should even be the case. I mean, whether we ought to do something largely depends, or at least partly depends on whether there's a feasible way to do mm -hmm. it, right? I mean, you know, we could say we ought to go get Chinese food for dinner. That's great, but if the only Chinese restaurant in town has been, you know, 
condemned by the health code folks and costs, you know, uh, you know, hundred dollars a plate. Well, then maybe in that case, you know, we, we shouldn't you might want do to it. reconsider. Yeah, right. You might want to reconsider. So I've never heard a good explanation of that, but you might very well have some people try to leverage the word "ought" to sort of get away from having to defend the practical aspects of it. I'm not a fan of that, but it's something to be aware of. Um, provide well, Webster just defines provide as to make available. Again, I don't see like a lot of room for cleverness here. Uh, make available is very consistent with what the practical, like real world examples of jobs guarantees are. It's not mandatory, right? You don't have to take no. it. Uh, it's not mandatory federal employment. We just did mandatory voting. This is not <laughs> mandatory employment. It's there if you want it, right? You can take it or leave it, right? Another thing about uh, provide though is that, you know, and this may just be sort of the overall framing of the resolution is it doesn't specify any like time frame for like how long this has to last. And you mentioned with like the Works Progress Administration, this was more of a temporary thing to get us out of a depression, right? And so, you know, one conceivable sort of creative way of coming at this might be somebody saying, well, we need to do a federal jobs guarantee just to get us out of the coronavirus crisis. Now, I probably wouldn't run it that way because I think a lot of the advantages of a jobs guarantee, as we're going to talk about later, come from like long-term stabilizing of the economy. And if you say we're just going to do it for a short period of time, you sort of sacrifice like huge swaths of the potential benefits. But I guess you could, right? And I mean, the, the other thing is that part of the federal jobs guarantee is that it takes time to set up the infrastructure, yeah. right? Yeah. And that if, if they are running something that's more short-term, let's say just for COVID, then you probably have a lot of better ground arguing for things like stimulus checks or other things that have plenty of more evidence in the short term. Exactly. So again, I don't think there's anything in the resolution that necessarily prohibits an affirmative from running like a time limited plan or something because I don't think it says we have to have it forever. I just don't think that's strategically very smart because you're setting up this massive infrastructure program when it would be vastly more efficient, as you say, to do it through direct checks. And then you're giving up the benefits that we're going to talk about of like long-term smoothing out of the economy. So I, I don't know if there's a good reason to do it. I guess you could, right? And then the last one would be just the phrase, you know, federal jobs guarantee, right? And so there are plenty of definitions of this that you can find out. There are obviously plenty of specific plans that we will talk about later, right? Uh, but one comes from thirdway.org and it just says, a federal jobs guarantee is as simple as it sounds. Everyone in the country will be guaranteed a job by the U.S. government should they desire one. And I think this is a good definition for the AF because it's really broad. It encompasses any permutation of a federal jobs plan you could want. So if this is your definition, then pretty much anything that gives everybody a job is topical, right? So I like this as a broad, just sort of general purpose definition for the AF. Uh, and, and so at the end of the day, even though I am you know, I am, you know, a big plan, a big fan of, of being kind of creative sometimes with definitions. I just don't see a really good way to do it. Um, the last thing I do have on definitions, though, is the fact that it, the, the, the use of the indefinite article A in a federal jobs guarantee, that should remove any doubt that plans are okay. Right. In other words, running a specific plan because it doesn't, you know, we're not naming a specific policy like we were on the PF topic on Medicare for all. A federal jobs guarantee basically means take your pick, like whatever version of that you want to run. Now, we'll talk late, later on about whether or not it's a good idea to run a plan, whether you have to run a plan. I know a lot of people will be, but I think that, you know, unless you're in a circuit or an area of the country where the judges just for whatever reason, reject plans out of hand, I think you're going to see a lot of people picking their favorite version and running that, which is why you're going to need to be familiar with them. So not a lot of news on definitions. Nirmal, did you have anything else on this? No, I think it's pretty straightforward. You know, it's not like we're throwing out the whole current regulation system that's there. We have a lot of the same things when it comes to employment rules and things like that. It's pretty straightforward as far as I can tell. Right. So with that, let's move on next, talk a little bit about some values and criteria. Okay, so on values and criteria, if you know me, if you've watched these videos before, you know that I'm a big believer in not getting super creative with the value. Um, and the reason for that, as I've said before, is the value is supposed to be like the ultimate load star that we link to in Lincoln Douglas. It's supposed to be the thing about which no one can say, why does that matter, right? And so when you get too creative with things, like if you were to use like work as your value, right? Well, there are certainly questions as to whether, wh why and whether, you know, work is intrinsically valuable. And you just don't want to have those fights if you don't have to, right? So I'm a big believer of picking things like morality, justice, you know, just benefit to humanity, things like that. Things that it's very difficult to argue are not 
uh, are not valuable as your value. And then when you want to get creative a little bit, you can move on and do that sort of uh, with your criterion and certainly with your substantive argument. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about like different values. I'm going to talk a little bit more about criteria. So on the criterion side, um, I think that a large majority of the rounds that you see, uh, whether they admit it or not, are going to be uh, judged and debated on the idea of, of utilitarianism, right? Like practical benefits, benefits to humanity, cost-benefit analysis, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, because, you know, this is a policy resolution. It's about, you know, helping people who are unemployed. It's about smoothing out the economy. The people who advocate for it overwhelmingly base their justifications of it in practical economic terms. And so you're going to see a lot of that, right? And, you know, I, I think that, you know, if you want to be a little bit more clever about it, you can use the old standby, which is Rawlsian distributive justice, which comes from John Rawls, and that just says that we ought to do a utilitarian analysis. We ought to ask what creates the greatest good for the greatest number, but we ought to weigh the interest of the least advantaged most, right? We ought to put ourselves behind an imaginary veil of ignorance and ask what we would want if we didn't know our place in society, and then we would rationally prefer the things that help the least advantaged because they're the ones who have the most to lose, right? And, and what this does, what you using a Rawlsian theory, like wh whichever version of it you use lets you do, is number one, it lets you base your case on utilitarian benefits and use all of the statistics and all the data and all the theory that we're going to talk about there, right? But two, still make the normative moral argument that the least advantage should come first, right? That, that a benefit to a person who is desperately poor is more important than a benefit to Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or whoever, right? Um, and, and that gets you around some of the stock criticisms of utilitarianism, like the idea that we could throw away, you know, a certain number of lives to benefit others. Um, so I think Rawls would be a good option here, you know. Now you could get a little bit more esoteric. There are, there are ideas from people like the economist Amartya Sen, um, who talks about like welfare economic theories and ideas of like human thriving if you want to. We don't really have time to dive into those, but welfare economics might be an option. But I think Rawls just generally sort of encapsulates how the vast majority of policymakers and real world thinkers are going to come at this, right? No, yeah, definitely. Because even when you're trying to look at something from a very deep philosophical standpoint, whether it's regarding to policy or any kind of decision that you're trying to make, you're going to come back to this basic idea of utilitarianism and like how you're going to be able to benefit people by this action. So we have to make sure that we're able to bring that theory into practicality and be able to make the link between the philosophy and the actual action. I think that's actually a really good point, which is that like even among debaters who try to use more esoteric theoretical stuff as their criteria, I bet like in the vast majority of cases, the round is still going to keep coming back to like statistical benefits and economics and things like that. So even if you use like a different sort of theoretical basis, you've still got to be ready to debate the statistics and stuff. Now, if you don't want to go with straight up utilitarianism, I think there are some really good options. And, and, and the, the ones I look at are the sort of conflicting theories of, of like what the value of work is. Right, what the intrinsic value of work and labor and human dignity are, how are they correlated with one another. And I think there are strong sort of theoretical groundings on both sides, right? So on the affirmative, right, you would have this idea that you know, a lot of philosophers have said that work provides people with a certain degree of basic dignity, right? And this is something that, that, that is intuitively true. Like if you look at, there's a Pew poll from 2015 that says that, you know, like 80% of Americans view themselves as hardworking. And there's lots of data out there about how Americans want to be seen as hardworking and identify their worth as a human being with, you know, their, their, their work ethic. And like we said earlier, this goes back as far as philosophers like Aristotle. It goes all the way through Karl Marx and up until the present. If you wanted to pick a sort of a, a you know, a, a more classical philosopher, uh, Emile Durkheim has a book, The Division of Labor and Society. This was from back in 1892, so maybe not classical, but not modern either. You know, and, and his basic idea is that work and labor bring us together in a collective enterprise as a society and build a sort of sense of solidarity and mutual dependence. Now, whether you agree with that or not, you know, who knows, but D'Souza back in 2018 summed it up this way. He said, if societies are organisms, if they possess a specific social and specific moral order, those specific orders have to be made possible by the effects of the division of labor. Accordingly, the division of labor creates societies that can only achieve stability and reproduce themselves through a set of values that are specific to them and must be created through the division of labor. That is why it has to generate a specific bond 
bond between its members, a feeling that can only result from the division of labor, a feeling of solidarity. So the idea is that we're all working together, you know, contributing our part to the larger enterprise of making society prosperous and meeting the needs of all these people, right? And this potentially links well to the idea, for example, that a jobs guarantee would be better than something like a universal basic income, right? Because it, all of us are working together on these sort of public works projects or in the private sector or whatever toward a common shared goal as opposed to just everybody doing their own thing. So if you believe in a sense of like shared solidarity and shared goals and things like that, it might be that Durkheim's theory is something that you want to look at, right? And it goes beyond having this kind of like net societal benefit as well because it also goes back down to the individual level. As Pope John Paul II talks about, it, he says that work is fundamental to the truth of human condition. Basically saying that work is intrinsic to being human. Through work, he mentions, that people become who they intend to be, who they want to be. They're able to realize their full potential and share in the activity of their creator. Basically trying to say that through work, they're able to have effect, have impact, and have personal development, whether it's religious, spiritual, or in terms of career development. Yeah, there's just a really strong argument, again, going back to Aristotle, that we certainly in the United States, maybe more than most countries, have adopted that the idea that work defines who we are. Now, there's good sides to that, and there's bad sides to that, as we're going to talk about in a second, but, you know, Durkheim and others, like John Paul, if you want to look to him, right, that's fine. Those are good options to explain that. A more contemporary view, though, that kind of makes a similar argument comes, uh, and this is sort of a critical view, comes from Professor Allison Pugh in 2012 in a piece called The Social Meanings of Dignity at Work, right? And what she talks about in this piece is basically something she calls an economy of dignity, right? And what, what she says is this refers to like a complex system of meanings by which people come to parlay and manage what counts as the life of their community, like which is a collective measure of what counts for social citizenship, the right to be heard and be seen, the right to be an active participant. Dignity in this view is supremely social, not simply in the way of being conferred by others as some sort of prize, but in its cultural essence in the collective process of making a social world, right? And the basic idea here would be by making work a right, and by making the work available to everybody, and by making it work on things of, of community value, right? Public works projects, fixing up the park, fixing up the school, not just toiling away to try to make profits for a corporation. You create an economy that's more based around sort of, you know, joint value and solidarity and dignity of all people, rather than just this atomized world where everybody does what they want to do. So that's kind of a more updated version of what Durkheim said, right? So, I mean, that's, that's certainly an option on the AF, but as we'll see, you know, it's not just the AF, it's also, you know, there are ideas about the role of work that, that on a philosophical level on the negative. So, one of the main ideas on the negative is going to be that linking work to your worth denies human dignity. Yeah. As Molly Snyder talks about in, in, in an article in Medium, she basically talks about how linking our dignity to our labor makes us dependent on our jobs for worth, as opposed to recognizing that our dignity and value is intrinsic to our humanity and our human potential. Basically speaking, it doesn't matter how much work you're putting in, how much you're tolerating from a boss, how much money you're making, or where you work. All that matters is that you as a human being intrinsically already have dignity, have self-respect, and have self-worth. Yeah, I think Snyder is a good, it's, it's in medium, so it's kind of a, a layman's explanation. You might or might not want to cite it, but it's a good sort of basic primer on the idea that linking our, our value to work is a sort of a, a, a kind of a pathology, like it's a bad thing, like it's something that, that is something we should try to avoid and in America in particular, in the United States in particular. You know, this is, this is not how we ought to gauge our worth. A, a more academic source on this is uh, Jonathan Malisic in the New Republic in 2017 had a piece called America Must Divorce Dignity from Work. And I, I think among other things, this article, you should definitely read it, um, even if you're not gonna use it, but it pairs up really nicely with, for example, like a negative, if, if a negative ran a UBI, because the, the piece is actually about why um, a UBI, universal basic income, is better than a jobs guarantee, because it talks about how um, it ends the false idea, right? The, the UBI ends a false idea that your worth as an American is tied to like how hard you work and how much you earn, right? And he points out, right, that social capital in this country comes from all different places, right? And, and work is just one of the places that it comes from. You know, tech billionaires are able to be tech billionaires not really because of how hard they work. They probably worked hard at some point, but, but they, they had a really good idea, right? It was because of the ideas that they had. And also because people agree to follow the law and not show up with pitchforks and torches and say, you know, you're too rich. And also because people 
people allow them to collect data from their devices. And for a million other reasons, we develop all this social capital, and work is just one of them, right? And what he says is that by, you know, a jobs guarantee would reinforce the idea that a human being's value is how much labor they can do. It almost makes them like a sort of, in a sense, like property, or a means to an end, right? Rather than an end in themselves, right? And so, you know, one big reason why a CEO can get away with making a thousand times as much as his lowest paid worker is that we are conditioned in this country to believe that our value is whatever we can get out of the market, right? And uh, a UBI on this theory, right, or, or another alternative would, would break that connection, whereas a jobs guarantee only serves to reinforce it. So, you know, I think that uh, that's a good option in terms of, you know, theory uh, for a negative criteria, the malicious piece. There are a lot of others, but basically, uh, whether you use utilitarianism, whether you use um, you know a more sort of uh, philosophical approach like with one of these, there are a lot of good options. Either way, you're still going to be talking about the practical effects. So that's one more reason why it's important for us to maybe jump forward now and do a quick overview of some of the basic practical concepts that surround some of these policy proposals uh, about a jobs guarantee. So we'll do that in just one second. Okay, so before we get into the app and the neg, I want to take just a couple of minutes and make sure we're all on the same page by going over some basic concepts uh, that I think relate to the jobs guarantee, uh, mainly talking about some of the macroeconomic theory that is kind of lies underneath it, and then two, looking at some of the major proposals so that we can know kind of what they actually look like, uh, because I think you're going to see them again and again. And then lastly, maybe tying up a few odds and ends with just a few quick notes that I couldn't put anywhere else in the video, so I put them here. Um, so, really quickly, I think it's very important to understand like that the idea of a jobs guarantee, you know, comes from theories about unemployment and about, you know, economic growth. And there's not enough time in the video for us to cover this in the depth it deserves. So we're going to give you some links and you really should read up on this until you personally understand it. So the very short summary is actually found in the Wikipedia page for jobs guarantee. So we'll obviously link to that. And you can sort of read about the idea how this comes from a desire to sort of regulate the boom and bust cycles of the economy while still being humane when it comes to things like unemployment, right? And then a more in-depth discussion is in the Chernaba uh, 2018 piece that we're going to talk about in a minute, which is actually where one of the plans for this comes from, right? But I want you to read both of those so that you can understand, you know, that the basic justification for a jobs guarantee is not, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we gave everybody a job? I mean, there's that, right? But it's basically the idea that it would be a better way to regulate the cycles of the economy and to do it in a way that is more humane. So let's talk about that for a second just to make sure we understand it, right? So um, economies go through cycles, right? They, they boom and they bust, right? They have the, the bull market and the bear market. They, they expand and they contract, right? And for nearly a century now, most developed countries have used something called Keynesian economic theory to regulate that. John Maynard Keynes, famous economist, he basically said that, you know, the government needs to spend money, right, to bring, through stimulus, right, to bring an economy out of a recession to get it going again, right? It, has, it is somewhat controversial, but in practice, it's more or less uniformly, universally accepted by everybody. Like we, we do it in our federal monetary policy. We do it when we write stimulus checks during COVID-19 to people. The idea is part of it is, is humanitarian, but part of it is we want them to have money to get the economy going again, right? And we can do it in a lot of different ways, right? We can do it through monetary policy. We can lower interest rates to make it cheaper to borrow. Uh, we can do direct payments like we've done in COVID-19. We can just write people checks and send them out. We can do public works projects. We can build new bridges and new roads and employ people on those, right? Um, and the idea behind Keynesian stimulus is we get investors and we get unemployed people off the sidelines, we get them back to working again, and they take their money and pump that back into their communities. They go to the grocery store, right? They go buy clothes for the kids to go to school, and that helps those places stay open, and it gets the economy going back rather than sort of becoming more of it, right? And that's the idea. But there's another side to it, and I, I promise you I'm getting to the part where we talk about unemployment. There, there, that's in there. It's a huge part of it. So when the economy, and when the stimulus works, right, the economy comes bouncing back, right? The, the economy heats up, right? And, and you might think, well, that's great. We want it to heat up. We want it to be as hot as it can possibly be. And the answer is actually, no, we don't. Because there's the downside to when the economy is going really, really fast. And that is that if almost everybody who wants a job has a job, uh, the economy is going to be growing so fast that you're going to see massive inflation. Now, obviously, I'm sure most of you know what inflation is. It's just your money being worth less. It's the idea that, you know, uh, $10 back in 1980, 
uh, was worth a lot more than it is today. It's the reason why your grandparents tell you stories about how they could go to the movies and get popcorn and soda for $2 and now it takes $20, right? When, when the economy expands and more people are working and we're printing more money, the money you have in the bank is worth commensurately less because it has a smaller, it's a smaller portion of the overall value of society, right? And so and we, inflation gets going really fast. Well, we don't want that. If inflation gets going really, really fast, then people have their savings, you know, eaten away at it. It's worth less and less and less. We want some inflation, but we want it to go slow so that, you know, the savings you have in the bank or whatever isn't, isn't wiped out, right? Well, how do we do that, right? Well, we pull back on the stimulus. What happens when we pull back on the stimulus? Well, you know, the economy slows down, right? And jobs go away and people get laid off and people get fired, right? And employment, unemployment goes back up. And so what economists like Chernova and others talk about is how unemployment, like having what Marx would call this mass reserve army of labor, of people who get employment when the economy is good and are unemployed when the economy is bad, they sort of serve as a buffer as like a cushion, right? Unemployment gets bigger when it's bad and smaller when it's good. And we have this mass army of people who just sort of serve as a cushion for us to be able to regulate the economy so that we can spend more to get the economy going and then pull back later on. Now that may sound kind of cruel, and it is, right? The idea that this huge group of millions and millions of people could be sort of expendable, right? That we could sort of say, well, you know, we don't really need you to be employed anymore. In fact, it's dangerous for you to be employed. It'll be too much inflation, so we're gonna let you be unemployed, right? And that, that rather than just being nice, is the core problem that the jobs guarantee in economic theory is designed to address, right? You've got to have this mass group of people who are not gonna be employed in the private sector to, in order to be able to expand and contract like you need to to keep the economy rolling along smoothly. And and so the basic idea behind a jobs guarantee is instead of having a mass army of unemployed people, why don't we just have a mass army of government employed people, right? And, and the idea would be, you know, basically this. And, and this would be a solution that not only would be more humane and more fair to them, right? It would, it would give them money when they need it. It would also be more economically efficient in terms of a way of regulating the economy. And so the basic idea would be a jobs guarantee, simple enough, we give anybody a job, like if they want one, if they need one, right? And so when we go into a recession, people lose their jobs, right? And so the idea is they're going to immediately start going to the jobs guarantee office and taking those jobs because they need money, right? Well, that automatically is going to serve as a form of stimulus, right? Because we're going to be writing government checks, government paychecks. We'll talk about how much later. We're going to be writing government checks to these folks, and they're going to be able to go out and buy groceries, and they're going to be able to go out and buy clothes for their kids to go to school, and it's going to keep the grocery store and the department store and the local town you know, going, and you're going to see a stimulus effect from that, right? And then when it works and the economy gets better, well, more jobs will be created, right? More private sector jobs, good paying jobs will be created, and people will leave the jobs guarantee program. And that's not a problem. That's what's supposed to happen. That's what we want to have happen under a jobs guarantee program. They, they leave and they take better paying jobs. And when that happens, we, we spend less, right? We're paying fewer government workers, so the stimulus goes down, right? And the basic idea is it happens automatically. Rather than us having to have these like lengthy decisions like we have right now with COVID-19, well, are we going to have a stimulus check? Let's have a big, long political fight about whether we mail out another stimulus check. It'll just happen automatically, right? When the economy's bad, people People will become unemployed, they'll receive government jobs and get paid for them. When it's good, they'll leave those jobs and you'll have less. And so you'll have this automatic regulation where we pump more, more money in when we need it and less money in when we don't. And more importantly, rather than using them, as Mark said, as this mass reserve of people who are experiencing the horrors of unemployment, they will always at least have a basic subsistence level job. So the argument is it's both more humane and it's more efficient from a perspective of keeping the economy smooth, which is why we're going to see later when we talk about the app, the argument's going to be this will actually grow the economy dramatically because it will keep us from having these cycles of boom and bust, right? And employers and businesses like that. They like a smooth economy. They're able to invest more predictably and grow faster when they know we're not going to have these massive cycles of, of good and bad, but keep it more or less smooth down the middle, right? So I know that's a lot to take in, but I would strongly recommend you go and sort of read up on these things so that you understand that it, it really is an idea of a macroeconomic regulation that, that was the genesis of the jobs guarantee, plus it's also a nice, good thing to do for people on a humanitarian level, right? 
Now, on the downside, what the, what the negative is going to say, well, that's all well and good, right? That's all fine, but the devil's in the details, right? And the problem is, yes, that sounds really good from a perspective of regulating, uh, the, uh, regulating the, the cycles of the economy, but the problem is you're going to be competing with the private sector and taking away the labor that they need in order to be able to grow, right? So now, and this depends heavily on how much you pay like people and what the benefits are. If you have really, really bad jobs in this federal jobs program, like, like minimum wage jobs for like $7.25 an hour with no benefits, well then it won't do too much damage because most jobs don't meet that, right? But the higher you go, right, the more you pay. Like if you pay $15 an hour or if you pay more than that, and if you have really good benefits, well guess what? Um, people are not going to work in these private sector jobs. Now, you might say, well that's good those private sector jobs are not as good but the truth is you know and there's a lot of theory behind this the private sector is generally better at driving innovation right the private sector is where we get you know innovations technology um, you know economic growth tends to come from there that's how people vote with their feet and buy things from the private sector they buy you know iPads and they buy laptops and they buy cars and things like that and and that's how you know typically speaking you know an economy tends to grow organically and if we're fighting the private sector by taking taking workers away from it, we're going to stifle its ability to grow and that's going to hurt everybody in the long run. So those are the basic sort of underlying economic theories. Um, it, now, I think before we get to the, the particulars, it's probably worth kind of talking about like what the major proposals are, right? I mean, because these are the ones you're going to see a lot of and I think we need sort of need to talk about them. So you want to run through those? Okay, so let's dive into the major policy proposals that we see so far. One of the major ones that we're going to be covering today is going to be the Paul Darity Hamilton proposal that comes from the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities in 2014. It basically says that we should start off by establishing a permanent agency. And the aim of this proposal is to eliminate involuntary unemployment, which basically means that there are a group of people that are willing to work at average market rates, whatever the market pays them for their job, but are unemployed for whatever reason. Now, moving on from that, it says that they should have a minimum wage of $11.83 per hour for this particular government job. And, and, this, and this is important because, you know, we're going to see in a second that some competing proposals are significantly more than that, and that's going to lead to a different cost-benefit trade-off, right? But Yes, of course. And from there, these wages that they're given out to these people are indexed to inflation, which means that depending on how the, the economy is reacting to the program and the private sector it's growth- It's gonna go up and up and up. It's gonna go up and up and up, right. exactly. And so in addition to you know, having a minimum wage, they're, ordered, they're also proposing that we should have benefits, such as health insurance for all full-time workers, which is comparable to all civil servants and elected federal officials. Now that's gonna cost a lot. Yeah. And that's gonna get, and we're gonna get into how that, how exactly this is gonna play into whether or not this policy proposal is uh, worth investing in. And in addition to costing a lot, it's also going to make it very hard for a lot of employers in lower income regions of the country, like here in the Mississippi Delta, we'll talk about this on the negative, to compete for workers. And it's going to mean that in some like rural towns, the private sector is, is going to have a really, really hard time competing with a job that pays 12 bucks an hour and has retirement benefits and health benefits that you don't see a lot of those for unskilled workers in places like Greenville, Mississippi, right? No, of course not. Because if you are being offered a job that gives you health insurance, good health insurance, a retirement plan, paid family and sick leave, and one week of paid vacation for three months work, you're not really going to try to look for other places, especially in your own rural area, that might not be able to compete with that. Now, in order to administer this big agency and go through this entire program, the policy proposal says that it should be administered by the Department of Labor. Now, how they're going to do that is they're going to give out grants to state and local governments and native tribes to start these public works projects. And, and they're going to closely monitor it to make sure that the work is being done properly and that these projects are actually working on things that are important. And it also has a provision for federal intervention if there is no full employment in communities, which I'm not sure how exactly they're going to go, going to go about doing that, well. because that seems like a very uh, dubious thing to just simply put in that, well, if well, you don't have full well, employment. There'll be, there'll be something we'll do if yeah. that happens. Yeah, <laughs> there will definitely be a step that we will take of some kind. Um, the other thing is a few other points on it. You know, it's got an option of full or part-time employment, which is nice. Um, you know, it's an hourly job, so it can be full-time or part-time. 
Um, the, the cost estimate from Paul and Darity is $543 billion to start with, but the idea behind it is, and this is important when you're talking about cost if you're the AF, right, the idea is that's going to shrink over time, particularly now. If you start it now in the middle of COVID-19, you've got massive unemployment. So the cost is going to be really high on the front end. But the idea is going to be that, like we said earlier, by having this program in place to sort of smooth out the economy, you're actually going to grow the GDP. The, the, the argument that we're going to talk about in the app is not only will you have federal jobs, you'll also be growing the private sector because the economy will be smoother, right? And so over time, you'll actually help the private sector grow so much that the need for these jobs will go down. So the, 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 the idea, at least from the, from the proponent's proposal on that, from the proponent's perspective on this, is that you start out up here with this number of jobs, and then as it works and stimulates the economy, the need for federal jobs goes down, 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 down. And it might go back up when there's a recession, but it generally stays lower, right? Yeah, and to add to that, you know, how exactly are they going to pay for this? And that's one of the biggest questions that will come up, especially when you're talking about big federal programs like this. And this policy assumes that the cost of implementing this particular program will be offset by increases in local, state, and federal tax revenues and the decrease in the use of social insurance programs. So what that essentially means is that if you are providing, you know, $11 and something cents as a minimum wage to these people, then you're basically putting more money in their pockets, which will allow local, state, and federal governments to get more money yeah. in tax revenues. Now, to be clear, it's not replacing these programs. It's not doing away with, like, Medicaid or TANF or things like that. It's saying there will be fewer people who economically qualify for them. These are means-tested programs where you have to earn below a certain level to get them or as you earn more your benefits go down so we're not getting rid of Medicaid we're not getting rid of TANF but we are seeing less use of them and the people who get them might be getting less as a result of having a job right yes and so the money that you would be spending on those programs to accommodate a large group of people you can now reallocate towards this federal jobs guarantee and then that can also once again fluctuate as the number of jobs grows and shrinks now, the other big uh, alternative proposal to that is the one that comes from Sharon Ava, who is, I think, a professor at Bard College in 2018. Uh, she is a big author on this, and you're unquestionably going to be reading a lot of stuff from her for the AF. Um, but it's also a good, uh, you know, it's also a good proposal. And even if you don't use her proposal, she's got a lot of good information, like we said earlier, explaining the economic rationale of smoothing out the economy, making the private sector grow. So it's worth reading hers. But hers is basically, you know, it's permanent and voluntary. So it's not just a temporary thing, like we said earlier. It's not just for COVID-19 or whatever, right? Uh, $15 an hour plus health insurance. Man, if 1138 plus health insurance was going to be tough to compete with among like agriculture businesses and farms in, you know, the the, the rural south fifteen dollars an hour and you know and health insurance i know that in some of the big cities you guys might be from that's not going to be a big deal in rural areas of the country that's just an incredible incredible opportunity that it's going to be hard to match she also calls for like local jobs she says it's basically similar to the to, similar to the first proposal you know you're going to see uh federal funds but they're going to be allocated to local governments to do the programs that they think are, are important overseen by the department of labor they're going to use job banks in other words they're going to have like like if a community community thinks, oh, we need somebody to go be the custodian at the park and clean up the park every day. Well, you'll put that in the job bank. Like, okay, there's a job that needs to be done. And then as people come in the door to the jobs program, they'll just take things that match up with their skill sets off the shelf and say, okay, well, this is your job right? Um, hopefully it'll be a good match, maybe not. But it is an add-on. It, it is clear she does not replace things like SNAP, TANF, other programs. It's an add-on that goes beyond those, although, of course, the means-tested ones, you're going to see less use, like we talked about before. It also, similar to the Paul Darity proposal, offers flexible days and hours for students and caregivers. It offers training and apprenticeships. That could be a unique uh, perspective, the idea that, you know, you would be better off spending your time working and learning a skill, learning a degree of training, that, so that way when you get out, you'll be you know, more marketable in the economy. So that's an option there that you can look at. Um, and the basic idea, similar you know, to other proposals, is it's going to start out large and expensive, and then it's going to shrink to help the private sector grow. Um, she also talks about how we might fund it. So one thing you might want to do in terms of like reading what she's written uh, you know, is, is read the section she writes about how this could be funded under existing law. She talks about things like the Budget Control Act, uh, supplemental appropriations bills, and she basically talks about how, yes, the funding is going to go up and down, but we already do, uh, you know, variable funding with things like natural disasters. Like, we appropriate money when a hurricane comes through and ravages the Gulf Coast. We can do that here. We can estimate our costs by looking at, like, rolling averages from prior 
years. So you can probably cut some good cards from her 2018 piece about like how exactly we would fund this if people if you're worried that people might run arguments about how we couldn't know how much to appropriate for it. And you know what she says is the estimated cost to start would be 1.3 to 2.4 percent of GDP. So in her book, we're talking about something like 425 to 450 billion dollars, which again, huge amount of money. You need to understand the framework for like how much that is. In the United States, we spend a little over 500 billion on the entire military, right? I mean, the entire tax revenue that we take in right now is something on the order of three trillion. So you're spending a sixth of that on this program. So it's a massive amount of money right but and you need to be aware of that so these are two options for plans they're both actually pretty similar to each other you might want to delve and look at the specifics and see which one you like better now one question you might ask yourself is do i have to run a plan right do i absolutely have to run a plan and there's there's sort of two schools of thought on this um, one school of thought is if you run a plan that lets you have a degree of specificity about what you're claiming right you don't have to just sort of defend every kind of ridiculous out there idea that some columnist wrote about you can say no 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 that's not what i'm calling for my plan does something different on the other hand, there, though, there's an argument that maybe you should be somewhat deliberately vague, right? In other words, if you know enough about the sharing of a proposal and, you know, you know enough about the Paul Darity proposal, right, well, you could sort of leave it vague as to which one you're advocating for. And then when your opponent commits to attack a specific thing, you know, you might just say, well, I didn't specifically say we were going to do anything like that. There are many different proposals we could use. I, I don't know why you're assuming that I would pick that particular one. So I think there's sort of two schools of thought about whether you want to, you know, use a plan or not use a plan. Having a little bit of deliberate ambiguity on what exactly you're advocating for in some circuits against some debaters might be a good idea. And then the last thing I have before we move on and finally get to the app is just, just a little note here. I don't know why I put it here, but I thought it was kind of interesting. Is a federal jobs guarantee a popular idea with, uh, with voters and with Americans? And the answer is, like so many things, it 100% depends on how you frame it. So there's a Hill-Harris poll from 2019 that found that 78% of Americans strongly or at least somewhat support a jobs guarantee when it is described as a, quote, federal jobs program that creates jobs for the unemployed, right? Okay, so 78% when you frame it that way. A 2018 third way poll found that only 9% support a jobs guarantee when you frame it as a new program that guarantees full-time government jobs to anyone who would like one. Right, so it, it heavily depends on how you frame it. And that may be true with some of your judges too. I just thought that was really interesting. So that is a little bit of just sort of the overview of some of the concepts to make sure we're talking kind of all in the same terms. You got anything else on that? No, I think, I think we've done a pretty good job covering all the basics and now we're ready to dive into the specific arguments. So let's do that by looking at the affirmative in just one second. Okay, so at long last, let's talk a little bit about the affirmative, and there's a lot to cover here. So uh, I, I, I'm reluctant to do this, but I'm going to do it for you because, you know, because I love you guys, you're great, you know, but um, if you are pressed for time, right, if you are watching this video the night before the tournament and you are trying to write your app, first of all, what are you doing, right, you shouldn't be doing that, you're better than this, you need to put in the work. But if for whatever reason you are, and you needed to read one single thing as kind of a starter on the app, uh, one piece that I would recommend is Paul Darity and Hamilton uh, from 2017. It's a piece called Why We Need a Federal Job Guarantee. It's in Jacobin, uh, Jacobin Magazine. Um, and it lays out some of the better like general arguments like, for example, reducing poverty and improving infrastructure. It also does a really good job of anticipating and responding to common counterplans and objections. It actually directly responds to UBI proposals, uh, the idea that automation will make a jobs guarantee outdated. So again, if it is the night before the tournament and you are watching this for the first time, uh, you might click on that particular link to help you with your app. Obviously, you know, to become a better debater and to become a well-educated person, you need to, to look at all this stuff and do the work. But that would be one place where I would start. Um, another thing I'll say before we get to specific arguments is it is really important, I think, how you talk about a jobs guarantee, particularly if you're in front of more like lay judges, like less experienced judges. So, you know, I, one thing I think that's important to, to note, right, is that we're, we're going to have a certain number of people that cannot be employed by the private sector. That's just the way it is. You will never always have full employment and there will be devastating consequences from that. And the only question we're really answering here, right, is do we want that sort of buffer stock of people to be a mass army of unemployed people suffering the disastrous effects of unemployment or do we want it to be an army of people who are actually employed gainfully working to make the country better and right, actually developing skills, developing training and things like that. And when you frame it in that way, like we're 
we're going to have this number of people. This cost exists. Will we have the cost happen through catastrophic unemployment that destroys people's lives, or will we have it happen through you know, a program that actually gives them a job, gives them subsistence, stimulates the economy, and helps them prepare for having unemployment in the future? It's a good way to frame it. I think, Nirmal, you referred to it during the break as the idea of a public option. right? We talk about a public option for health care. This is a public option for employment. We don't want everyone to use it, but it's there if you need it. right? And I think that's good. So now, jumping into some of the specific arguments, the first one that I think you need, obviously, if you're going to talk in any way about benefiting people, is the idea that it, it reduces poverty, and in particular, it reduces poverty you know, better, than, um, better than other programs like the UBI. So this comes from the Paul Darity piece in 2017. Um, and what it points out is that you know, a, a federal jobs guarantee of the kind they propose right, would pay a minimum annual wage of at least $23,000 a year, rising to $32,000 a year, depending on how it was indexed to inflation, right? And what they say is that would eliminate the working poor, right? Because um, unlike a, a, a universal basic income, they actually directly address that. A universal basic income, most proposals there would look like something like $10,000 a year, which still leaves you in poverty, you know, as they know. But if you had two, for example, people in a couple working, making $23,000 a year, well, that's $46,000 a year. Not a huge amount of money, but enough to get by on, right? Enough to subsist on, enough to not be poor anymore. So, you know, one big point there is you immediately destroy the idea of compulsory poverty. Everybody has an opportunity opportunity to earn a decent wage in the United States, and I think that's important. Yeah, and it's actually uh, super important, as we've mentioned already, because simply having a job in today's day is not enough to ensure that you are not poor. Right. In fact, the Economic Policy Institute uh, did a study in 2011 that showed that 28% of those that are employed took home poverty wages. So you are working, but right. what are you working for? Yeah. The other thing this does is it effectively establishes the national minimum wage, right? Uh, and that's an important thing to talk about because if you can make $12 or $15 an hour on a government job, you're not going to go work, you know, dumping out the deep fat fryer at, at you know, Popeye's Chicken or at McDonald's, you know, for half that amount. Those jobs will disappear, right? So it also sets a minimum floor. And it also sets a minimum floor for the terms of your employment. Uh, employment will now have to have basic benefits, right? And in a world where we don't yet have Medicare for all, as we were debating last month in, in PF, where we don't have all of these other benefits, saying here is a job that will give you basic benefits establishes a basic floor for treatment of people, uh, a basic availability of medical care. I mean, you could link into arguments about just the, the harms that come from not seeking basic medical care because of the 40 million people in this country that are still uninsured or underinsured. There's tons of links that you can have to that to terminal impacts. And as a matter of fact, there's, there's one that I thought was men worth mentioning, but you can use any of them, right? If this is the way people are going to get health benefits and this is the way they're going to have money, then you can talk about all of the harms of, of not having those things and not having coverage and that, and that sort of stuff. But um, another note that I have, though, is that unemployment has devastating and lingering effects, right? Uh, and this comes from an Urban Institute study by Nichols and others in 2013. And what they talk about is just, it's, it's a long piece, and you can pick your favorite part from it. It's got lots of good cards in it. But it just talks about all the bad things that happen as a result of unemployment. So, for example, um, when you're unemployed, uh, this is from 2011, 63% of unemployed people skip dental visits, 56% put off needed health care, 40% reported not filling out needed prescriptions, uh, roughly twice the numbers that we see for people with full-time jobs, so they have disaster health consequences. And then they also talk about how being unemployed has lingering effects even after you get a job, right? So it talks about how workers that were displaced by unemployment in the 1980s saw 30% reduction in their wages uh, even 15 to 20 years after the displacement. 20 to 30 percent lower wages even 15 years after you got a, another job, right? So being out of the workforce and having your skills atrophy and not making connections and not just being in the, in the hunt, really, so to speak, reduces your long-term earning capacity dramatically. And so, you know, and then you could also talk, for example, about, um, you know, mental health consequences of unemployment. There's tons of literature out there about how it has disastrous effects on mental health and that in turn leads to costs that are imposed on families, uh, imposed on the healthcare system, and things like that. So definitely, you know, you want to have some really strong terminal impacts. There's a, 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 just a gajillion of them out there that you can find about just how bad and awful and horrific it is to be unemployed, how lingering the effects are, and how we're going to get rid of that all together in one stroke with this program. Yeah, just to echo what uh, he was saying over here, we see that Gallup in 2013 did a poll that showed that people that cannot work 
have the highest depression rate. So as we've mentioned already, that it has a very tangible toll on your mental health. So, you know, that's one major side of the coin, right? The idea that, I mean, and we could go on all day with different impacts, but, but you can find your favorite one. You can look at the links. The idea that it's helping individuals avoid just this catastrophic situation. The other side, though, is the idea that a jobs guarantee doesn't just help those who are in a disadvantaged position through lack of work. It also helps grow the economy as a whole, right? So as we talked about earlier, the macroeconomic theory, which is really where the jobs guarantee began, is not just, like I said earlier, hey, wouldn't it be cool if everybody had a job, right? It's more about the recognition that the private sector is going to expand and it's going to contract and it's not always going to be able to provide a job for everybody. And so we have to think about like what the best, most efficient, most fair way is to handle that. And the core argument that you get from proponents of the job guarantee is just like, look, the jobs guarantee is an automatic, efficient mechanism that lets you do Keynesian stimulus, turn it on, turn it off without even having to think about it, right? It's just doing the same thing that we already do, right? So when you talk about how expensive it is, well, guess what? When we have an economic recession, we spend trillions of dollars like we are right now under coronavirus doing stimulus. So the idea that if we had a $500 billion program that this would be something that is new, I I'll grant you there's a portion of it that would probably be new and greater, but we already do massive federal spending. So the argument is this is just a more efficient, direct way to do it. We don't just write checks for nothing. We give people checks for coming and doing work if and only if they lose their job or they don't want to work in their job anymore, right? And so it's a more efficient way to, to handle turning on the stimulus spigot. But it's also a more efficient way to handle turning it off. Because when the economy does start to rebound, we don't have to have big fights in Congress about like when to stop uh, you know, sending checks. We don't have to have big fights in the Federal Reserve about when to raise interest rates back up. It just automatically happens because people leave the job program, they go work in the private sector, and the federal government is spending less and less and less on on stimulus, right? So the idea is that this is going to be a more efficient way of doing it. And the theorists basically argue this is going to have a, a major beneficial effect on the economy as a whole. So when you look at Sharonova in 2020, she looks to the Levy Institute study, which we're going to talk about in a second, and it says that you know a, a federal jobs guarantee uh, would cost about 1.5% of GDP, but it would boost real GDP by half a trillion dollars and increase private sector employment by three to four million jobs. In other words, you're going to have more private sector employment, not less. And the reason for that is pretty simple. This is the reason why we do stimulus, right? Uh, employers and businesses don't like it when the economy is volatile and moving up and down because they don't know when they should invest. They're worried that the economy might go into the tank, right? And that they might, you know, lose what they've invested. They like it when the economy is smooth, right? They're more likely to invest capital in expansion, building a new plant, things like that. So the argument is by having this stimulus effect work and by smoothing out the recessions and slowing down the, the massive growth when we have it, we'll see a smoother economy and more private sector investment. And I would actually recommend that you look at the Levy Institute paper from 2018 that she cites, because this is going to be the place where you get a lot of the sort of macroeconomic benefits, right? You're going to find the bullet points. So just some of the ones that I found, the claims that they make here are, you know, real inflation adjusted GDP would be boosted by $560 billion per year, right? The economic stimulus would add up to 4.2 million new private sector jobs, which would lead to multiplier effects. The multiplier effect is the idea that for every $1 you spend on stimulus, you get some higher number of dollars worth of economic benefits, right? Um, and uh, even though it boosts GDP by over $500 billion a year and adds more than 19 million private and public sector jobs and raises the nationwide minimum wage by uh, $15 per hour, it will not have dramatic effects on inflation. It will not dramatically, you know, in, in, you know, increase inflation. So there's a lot of good empirical stuff here about just how good for the economy as a whole it would be. And I think you need to be prepared to argue this, even if you don't run it in your case, because the basic argument that a negative is going to run is, well, this is going to cost so much money, this is going to compete for jobs with the private sector and your response is no 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 it's not going it's going to generate a lot more revenue a, a lot more economic growth than it costs and it's going to create more jobs than it competes for right and i think that's important that you understand that so another huge aspect of this federal jobs guarantee is that it's going to help us improve public infrastructure yeah. now as we talked about earlier we saw that you know roosevelt had direct hiring programs during the great depression you had your civil and civilian conservation corps the works progress administration and they were very very successful at not only alleviating economic suffering as we've mentioned before but also create and improve america's infrastructure they helped build roads bridges schools parks 
cultural and social programs, and conserved natural resources. So we saw that it allowed for basically a revitalization and a preservation of what America's infrastructure was. Now, what we're looking at it today, it's nowhere near the state that it was in the past. We see that according to Carpenter and Hamilton, uh, did a paper in 2020 that showed how the current labor supply for public works is very inadequate and that we need to make sure that more people are working in these sectors to be able to revitalize the American infrastructure. We see that American government at all levels has weakened considerably over the past half century. They say that you know states cannot process unemployment benefits. Public health departments lack the capacity to monitor the health of citizens. Medical stockpiles have been depleted as we've seen during COVID. Federal, state, and local agencies that conduct research provide services to vulnerable populations and construct and operate infrastructure for transport, technolo te technology, and things like that have had the lowest workforce levels they've had in half a century or more. Yeah, and, and, and this lets you again access impacts that are common and come up in debate again and again about like how bad our infrastructure is. And you can look right now, you know, for example, the difficulty we have getting out PPE, personal protective equipment in certain states due to COVID. You can look at the crumbling status of roads here in Mississippi and in other rural states. You can look at the, the D and F grades that our bridges and other infrastructure have compared to other countries and how that has massive negative effects on the economy. You can go link to any of those that you want because basically you say, look, we're gonna have this army of workers who are out there doing the work and dramatically lowering the cost of all of these projects, right, that we couldn't do before. And you know, I think that it's, it's obviously a, a sort of strong independent angle to take. Now, in addition to sort of doing that as a general matter with like roads and bridges, it's also important that, you know, we could use th th this army of labor that we would have to respond to certain crises, like for example, climate change. And I think you had some thoughts on that. Yes. As we've seen, there have been numerous policy proposals thrown out to be able to combat the threat of climate change, one of them being the Green New Deal. Now, part of all these proposals is to include a plan to have mass mobilization of people, you know, the labor force that we've been talking about for so long, to be able to work to avoid the catastrophic impacts of climate change. Now, one of the biggest things is that, as we mentioned in our last uh, argument as well, that we need to overhaul our infrastructure. Now, that means electrification, decarbonization, making sure that we're moving away from fossil fuel and onto renewable energy sources that allow us to basically reduce our carbon footprint and ensure that we have a planet to live on. One of the biggest things is that we need people to work for this and that the infrastructure was the backbone of strong growth of our economy back in World War II. Now, as of today, we see the delays in traffic congestion and other issues cost us billions of dollars and that every dollar spent on infrastructure yields to $3 to GDP growth, as we've already mentioned before. Now, why is all this important? As we've mentioned before, we see that in order to be able to fix not only our current systems, but transition to a different system that allows us to better combat the rising global temperature, we need people to be able to mobilize and make sure that we're working on these projects. We need a lot of labor, yes, right? We we've got to rebuild, basically rebuild our electrical grid. We've got to fund, we've got to build like electrical car charging stations. We've got to build, you know, new power plants that use renewable resources. There's a huge amount of labor and a huge amount of cost that, that can't come from nowhere, basically, right? Yes. In fact, Griffith and Kalsich from rewiringamerica.org did a study on decarbonization which showed that it just just rewiring and the electrification of everything in the United States would create 25 million jobs that would be long-term jobs. And then there would be additional 5 million that would be sustained by the mid-century. So these aren't just jobs that, okay, you're, you know, you're, you're bringing them to the table, you do it, and then you're done. Right. No, no, you have to make sure that you're not only creating this new infrastructure, dismantling what we already have, but making sure that it is preserved, it is conserved. We have to make sure that there are people operating this infrastructure that is necessary for us to be able to continue moving forward. Yeah, and so you absolutely could consider, you know, running a, a Green New Deal sort of case, right, where you access not only the benefits of having these jobs, which we've already talked about, but again, the different terminal impacts you can uh, access. Well, you know, uh, you want to try to access all the benefits of avoiding climate change. And there we're talking about, you know, millions of lives lost globally, potentially. I mean, we have to show that it works. And then, you know, a lot, huge losses to the economy. Now, it's, it's a little bit difficult to show that, that one country doing it solves, but the United States is a major player. We've been really behind in our efforts to, to meet our climate change goals. We don't really have climate change goals right now. Um, but, but this is something where you can access not only the internal benefits of economic stimulus, 
uh, being humane to people who are unemployed, meeting their needs, but also the, the, the benefits of avoid, averting catastrophic climate change. Now, to be fair though, I think there's an important caveat that we need to mention that the negative would bring up, which is that y you as the judge don't necessarily get, I would say this is the negative, this would be my view, I would say that you don't necessarily get to fiat what these jobs are used for, right? That would be something called extra topical. Extra topicality means you're doing something that falls within the topic, but it's more specific than what the topic allows for. So for example, if the resolution says we should raise taxes, and your case is we should raise taxes and spend it on you know, solar energy. Well, the resolution didn't say anything like that. And, and, and you as the judge, arguably under sort of debate theory, you don't get to specify what the money you raise from a tax increase will be. And also, in theory, you don't get to specify how these new jobs will be used. The resolution says we do a federal jobs guarantee. So basically, when we do the guarantee, the way the, the jobs get deployed is however the government in power deploys them. And so the argument would be, well, yes, it might be that a, a particularly liberal democratic administration might deploy them to do the Green New Deal. But then on the other hand, uh, you know, if Trump were reelected, he might deploy them to help build the wall right on the southern border. Uh, or might use them to build, you know, a, a Republican administration might deploy them to build more highways that lead to more carbonization as opposed to less, like more use of cars, right, things like that. So there's absolutely no guarantee that you're going to be able to use these jobs for the thing you want to use them for. It's just as likely that they would be used for things that are antithetical to that. And if I'm the negative and my opponent is running something where we're using the jobs to do a particular project, my point is, judge, you can't fiat how we do that, right? And I think that's an important response and it is a risk if you were to decide to run like a Green New Deal type case. So, um, Another related point is that a jobs guarantee would be extremely effective, arguably essential, in mitigating crises like pandemics and natural disasters, right? So uh, how would that work? Well, obviously, you know, it would it'd work on a couple of levels. First of all, you know, when people lose their job as a result of, you know, restaurants and other places shutting down and businesses shutting down in COVID-19, well, immediately it would mitigate that problem by swooping in and giving them paid work that lets them continue to pay for, pay their rent, you know, buy groceries, buy clothes for their kids to go to school. But then, you know, imagine a world where, you know, when, when these people lose their jobs in a pandemic, they're immediately mobilized as like a force of people who go out and do testing, right? Right? They immediately become federally paid testers. They immediately become federally paid contact tracers. They immediately become, when we have a vaccine, vaccine distributors, right? Or let's take a different type of natural disaster. Let's take a hurricane. People lose their jobs because their business is destroyed. The very next week, they become employed as rebuilders. Like they go around helping to clear the streets and pave the streets and things like that until they don't need them anymore. So the argument would be that this would be, a, an, again, an automatically functioning way to help mitigate the consequences of disasters and also begin getting the country back on its feet, right? So those benefits will be great during crisis. And additionally, we see that because of things like that, when there are more large scale crises like COVID-19, we see that that would increase unemployment. For example, the Pew Research Center says that during the last few months, we said unemployment hit 13%. And this would once again contribute to that idea of this kind of program allowing us to be able to better withstand issues like this, things that come out of nowhere, where we can now transition people that aren't able to work because of their businesses being destroyed or not having enough money, but now they're able to transition into these public work sectors where they're able to have more impacts on their communities, whether that's at contact tracers, vaccine distributors, whatever that might be. Additionally, this doesn't have to be something that we're looking at a large scale crisis. It can also be a crisis within a smaller community. Right. Let's say that we have things such as food insecurity, we have issues such as homelessness and things like that. We can mobilize a labor force to be able to get extra helping hands for things like you know working in food kitchens or building homeless shelters. We can see that workers can be quickly retrained and sent out to stabilize communities regardless of the kind of crisis that they're facing. And one of the most important things with this is that, as we've mentioned before, the time that they spend working on projects like this right. would be way better not only for themselves, but also for the country as a whole, than if they were sitting unemployed. Yeah, yeah. So I think we've laid out a lot of major arguments on the app. We've, we spent a lot of time on it. I, a few more that I'll mention briefly that you might want to look at, and we might drop a few links. I'm not going to develop these. There are a few things. First of all, there's the idea of employment as a human right. The United Nations Declaration of Human Rights lists employment as a basic human right, and there are some sources out there. We'll drop at least one that does talk about how you can make just sort of a basic human rights case based on this. You don't even have to reach the utilitarian stuff. 
stuff, you can just say this is something every human being is entitled to as a matter of like just economic dignity, right? Another one would be more fair distribution of income, right? Uh, this would go to a Rawlsian type case because, you know, the cost of paying for this is going to be paid for through a progressive taxation system where, you know, most of the revenue is, or more of the revenue at least, is going to come from higher income people because of the progressive system and most of the benefit is going to go to lower income people because that's where the job comes from. So the idea of a, a fairer distribution of income by helping people at the very bottom while taking a little bit from the people at the very top, will it fix income inequality? Absolutely no, no it won't, but it'll be a more fair way of approaching the, the, at least the most extreme problems of economic inequality. So that's what I've got on the AF. You got anything else? No, I think we're good to go. Fantastic. All right, so let us now at long last transition to the final segment and talk about the negative. Okay, so uh, on the negative, um, just a few general points before we jump into it. Uh, you know, I, I use a quote sometimes in debate. I've told some of my debaters about this one. It's H.L. Mencken, the great American political commentator, once said that for every complex problem, there's a simple solution, neat, plausible, and wrong. And that is the approach I think you're going to have to take on the negative because jobs guarantee has a lot of intuitive value to it, like a lot, a lot of good points that people, if you don't think about it too much and you don't really poke and prod into it, it just sounds like it's almost too good to be true in some cases. So you are really going to have to dig in and talk a little bit to the judge about how this is really going to work, how there are better alternatives and things like that. Uh, another point I would have is that like you want to make sure you're using the right terminology, right? And one of the terms I like using when I'm thinking about the negative is the idea of make work jobs. Make work just being like making up something to do. Like if you're if you want to keep your little brother busy, you know, your little five-year-old brother, you just give him something to do that doesn't actually add value. And the whole point here would be like if these jobs added value, if there was something that needed to happen, you know, on their own, well, we would have, you know, created them either, either as public sector jobs on their own without a federal program or in the private sector they'd be being done, right? And they're not. And so by definition, the argument would be from the negative is these things are not things that are adding uh, much societal value because if they were, they would have happened some other way to begin with. So calling them make work jobs, you know, is a way I think to effectively categorize, you know, kind of what they would be and, and, and make the judge think in those terms. In fact, there's a quick little small anecdote that's not necessarily true, but it's a story that is spread around in a lot of economic circles. It said that Milton Friedman once visited a country and he saw them trying to excavate something, a bunch of people going back and forth, you know, digging stuff out. And then he asked them, well, why aren't you using machines? You know, right. that would make the things a lot faster. And then one of the people replied saying that, oh, because our politicians wanted to create jobs. And then H.L. Mencken replied, well, why don't you use spoons instead? So that is kind of what a make work job <laughs> is, because right. now you're trying to basically create value out of Nothing. And that also goes to some of the points about dignity, right? Because, you know, dignity comes from having a job that's actually useful. If you know that your job is just, you know, doing work for the sake of doing work and it doesn't add a lot of value, it's hard to derive a lot of dignity from that. We're not going to spend a ton of time on it, but I do think the idea of saying that this is not like real meaningful productive work, if it were, it would have happened without a federal program, is something that's, you know, potentially valuable. So anyway. But anyway, uh, the first thing I think we we're going to talk about, that you were going to talk about, is just the sheer cost of this, right? Oh, yeah. And I'm I mean, we've already covered it a little bit with regards to the plans, but we need to get into why exactly it costs too much and how it can actually exceed, exceed what the estimates that we provided earlier talked about. So according to Third Way, we see that they have estimates for the, uh, the Paul Darity Hamilton plan and the Sheridan plan. So if these plans employ 10 million people or 15 million people, now the cost for the Paul and the, the Paul plans respectively is $560 billion a year and $840 billion a year. And for Chernova, it's $468 and $702 billion a year. So we see that there is a lot of variation here. But here's the thing, even at this kind of maximum capacity of 15 million, this program has a lot of high costs. Now, on the other hand, if you see programs like Social Security, they cost $922 billion for 61 million people. And that was as of 2016. That is a way better use of money than spending almost the same to only help 15 million people. Uh, sorry, 15 million people. We see that the infrastructure needed to provide this kind of federal jobs guarantee is too costly for the benefit that you're getting because you're only benefiting these 15 million people. Whereas something like a UBI would cover way more people and would have similar costs to it as well. 
The other thing is that the costs that have been provided are only in the context of low unemployment, which means that at the height of recessions, when you have more people coming into these kinds of programs, right. the, when, you know, for example, the unemployed and the underemployed were 17.1% back in uh, 2008, this cost could double in a downturn to more than $1 trillion. And what this would do is that this would crowd out spending on other priorities, such as healthcare, education, infrastructure, et cetera. And it can come at the cost of other safety net programs that are supporting children, disabled Americans, and those that cannot physically do work that are left out of this federal jobs guarantee. Yeah, now, you know, the, the argument the AB is going to make is, oh, don't worry, we're going to be growing the economy. There's going to be this massive stimulus effect, so it's going to, you know, maybe not pay for itself, but the, the net cost is going to be dramatically reduced, which is why I think the negative does have to hit back and say, you know, what is the, can you point to a model where that's actually happened? Is there a country that has implemented a jobs guarantee that's seen its uh, economy just take off like that? And if so, why doesn't every country do this, right? I mean, if, if this is just this automatic way to grow your economy, it seems a bit implausible, right? So you're going to have to hit back on that. If you can win that, the idea that it doesn't pay for itself, that it doesn't, you know, skyrocket the economy, this is a huge amount of money, right? This is, again, uh, uh, roughly the same as what we spend on the military. And unlike the military and unlike massive programs like Medicare and Medicaid, we can't plan for it. Right? It's going to be whatever it's going to be, and it's going to be more the worse the economy is. Right? And so that's a, writing a blank check and saying, we'll just pay however much this costs right, is, is potentially a dangerous thing. Now, the AF comes back and says, well, we, we have to do that anyway. We do stimulus. Like, we, we, this year in 2020, we've, you know, taken on trillions and trillions of dollars in debt, way more debt than we've had in the past, because we've got to do stimulus to try to get us out of this situation, right? So, anyway, the cost is a, major, is a you know, major, major issue. Now, relatedly, looking to the larger economy as a whole, you know, I think you have to argue, or at least try to argue as the negative, that this is going to, that a jobs guarantee is going to stifle innovation in the private sector, right? And here's what I'm talking about. So, you know, as much as we like to denigrate the private sector and say that it's cruel and it's unfair, the reality is private sector growth in this country has made us dramatically better off than we were decades ago. If we look to the inflation-adjusted uh, per capita income in the United States, that's even with adjusting for inflation, uh, the per capita income in this country in 1959 was $14,000 a year, and in 2019 it's $51,000 a year. So it's more than three times as much, right? It's, it's a dramatic, dramatic increase uh, in terms of, it's almost four times as much. And that's as a result of, you know, primarily private sector growth, right? And to have private sector growth, what you have to have is people going to the places where innovation is happening. And what that involves is people going out and taking risks and having to, you know, for example, um, if uh, the, the tech industry is growing in San Francisco and it's growing in Boston, and you live in a small town in the Midwest or the South where the car plant just shut down, well, you know, for the economy to grow, what has to happen is the labor supply has to go where the innovation is, right? We want people to get up and go and say, you know what, there's no jobs here in Flint, Michigan. There's no jobs here in Greenville, Mississippi. We need to get up and we need to go to Boston. We need to go to San Francisco. We need to train ourselves and get better educated, right, and be able to do these jobs. That's how economic growth happens. And a federal jobs guarantee is going to say to a lot of people, no, you don't right? It would be much easier and much more comfortable for you to just stay here in Mississippi or stay here in Michigan. And you don't have to improve yourself. You don't have to learn any new skills. You certainly don't have to take a risk and go anywhere where these jobs are. And what that's going to mean, you stay here and, and have a comfortable $15 job with benefits. And that's going to stifle the ability of industries around the country to attract the labor that they need to be these dynamic industries like the tech industry, you know, and like, for example, like the fracking industry, whether you like it or not, like to take people to the oil fields in Texas and things like that because there won't be an incentive to do that, right? But more specifically, on a macroeconomic level, the argument would be this is going to be devastating to the economies of less developed areas. And there's an article from Born 2018 it's called A Jobs Guaranteed Economic Disaster. This is from the Cato Institute. And here's what he says. It's not inconceivable that over 25% of the labor force could find itself part of the jobs guaranteed scheme. This crowd out is likely to be particularly acute in low productivity regions and ironically after economic downturns. A nationwide jobs guarantee program paying 50 $15 an hour will be particularly attractive to workers in low-wage regions by setting a de facto wage floor. The program will prevent private investment in regions on the basis of cheap labor.
river, right? And again, this is the idea that if you are in the Mississippi Delta, instead of working for $10 an hour, you know, with a private farmer or something, or a private, you know, like for Walmart or whatever, or for, you know, a, a local business, local grocery store, you're not going to do that. And it's going to be very difficult to get any private business, organic business off the ground here, and everybody's going to become dependent upon these much better paying, much better benefits jobs, right? And, and you know, arguably, you could say if you want to use a UBI, a universal basic income alternative, is that a UBI wouldn't do this because a UBI arguably makes a minimum wage job more attractive, right? If you're making $10,000 a year, that's not enough to live on, but it's enough that if you go and get a minimum wage job and make another $18,000 a year, well, you're starting to have the ability to be, to be okay from that, right? So the idea would be that a UBI would be a better alternative because it wouldn't crowd out and destroy economic growth in these impoverished regions that desperately need private sector jobs more than anybody else. And all, th lastly, on the macroeconomic level, before we get to some of the alternatives, the, uh, there's the idea that this is going to accelerate automation, right? Automation is the idea that our jobs are gradually being replaced over time, unskilled jobs in particular, by AIs, you know, mechanization, drones, eventually robots and things like that. So Henwood in 2019 uh, argues this. It says it would put, it being the jobs guarantee, would put a lot of low wage employers out of business, often deservedly so, and force survivors to cut back on staffing, with machines taking the place of the people if possible. It would have massively uneven geographic effects. Again, it would be devastating in the Mississippi Delta wouldn't matter so much in San Francisco, right? Nearly one in six metropolitan areas, mostly small and in the South, have a median wage between $15, more than two-thirds, accounting for well over a third of employment, have a median below $18. So here again, employers in agriculture, construction, food service, places like things like that, in places like Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, places like that, are going to see a massive erosion of their ability to attract people. And what they're going to do is they're going to turn increasingly to automation. They're going to turn to the kiosks at the McDonald's rather than actually paying people. They're going to turn to, you know, investing in equipment to harvest the crops rather than paying people to go out and harvest it. And it's just going to accelerate the process of getting rid of jobs even more quickly than it does already. So those are some potentially devastating economic consequences of the jobs guarantee that, that, that really do question this idea that it's going to be just this wonderful economic boom for everybody. But the biggest thing, and I think that we're going to have to talk about, is alternatives. Because I think the vast majority of negatives on this aren't just going to throw up their hands and say, well, we should just do nothing, right? They're instead going to try to run a counter plan, a counter proposal of a better way to address the problem of unemployment and a better way to address the problem of income inequality. And I think probably the most common one is going to be universal basic income, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because if you do want to solve the problems that we are facing in society, what are you going to do if not a federal jobs guarantee? Now, one of the main things we talked about so far is the universal basic income. We have to first clearly mention that it is not possible to implement both a jobs guarantee and a UBI because, well, two main things. First, the cost. Both of these programs cost significantly more than what the federal government will be able to afford both simultaneously, so you have to pick one or the other. And two, the reduced incentive that, that you would have to work if you were given a UBI would mean that the kind of boom and bust situation that the jobs guarantee aims to fix would be significantly reduced. I think this is really important, by the way, that if you're going to run any kind of counter plan, right, on the negative, you do have to spend time establishing that it is incompatible, that they compete with each other. In other words, that the affirmative can't say in policy debate terms, uh, perm do both, right? That's, that's not going to be available. And so, you know, th there are arguments that you could do both of them together, and you need to be aware of those, and we'll drop a link. But I think there are better arguments that you can't. And so Professor Cynthia Eastland is a New York University law professor in 2019 actually had a really good article about a lot of things having to do with different proposals but one of the things she points out is that uh, a UBI and a jobs guarantee do seem to be incompatible with each other number one as normal said because of cost uh, and number two you know for the other reasons he gave it but number three right because they're really just fundamentally opposed to each other in what they're asking Americans to accept either one of these policies is going to be a massive heavy lift to get through Congress right one of them jobs guarantee asks people to say jobs and work are fundamental to our country and to getting benefits that you need. And the other one, UBI, asks people to accept that, no, jobs are not important. We shouldn't be working all the time. People should just get money for existing. That's basic to dignity. They are antithetical to each other. The possibility of getting both of them through the government and sustaining both at the same time when both of them require massive cultural shifts
shifts and are diametrically opposed is basically zero. Even if the cost weren't an issue, even if we could afford both of them, right? The idea you're asking people to just accept diametrically opposed principles that's never going to happen in the real world. So I think before you talk about why a UBI is a good idea, you have to either end your case or at least in a block, right, in a second line block, be ready to explain why you cannot do it at the same time, right? Yeah, this background is very important and sets up the arguments that we're going to get into right now. One of the main things for a UBI is that it, 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 it encourages innovation and risk taking, which is very crucial in the information based economy that we're living in today. Right. Now, Scott Santens gives a basic explanation in Medium, but essentially it comes down to this. So much of our wealth today comes from people that dropped out of college or took a risk to create some new great thing, whether it's Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, whoever that might be. But, uh, but we see that overwhelmingly, it's people that are uh, in the upper middle class that are doing this because they have their family as a safety net. What, what UBI would do is that it would tap the potential of many, many other potential innovators who just aren't in a position to take risk and risk failure. Because let's say you are making that poverty wage or you are not being able to work, then, when, then you're going to lose a lot if you're going to take that risk and if it doesn't pan out for you. Right. I mean, which would you rather do, basically, the question you asked the judge is put a bunch of people into make-work jobs where they're doing things that, by definition, the private sector doesn't think are important enough to do, right? Or give them the money where they can go out and take risks and, you know, create the next great startup or something like that, or at least create a better job for themselves or a small business or something. I mean, our economy is overwhelmingly you know, spurred our growth over the last quarter century to half a century has been spurred by innovators, like people who go out and, and come up with the next great thing, not people toiling away on make work jobs that, 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 you know, are just not necessary. And I think that's important, right? And a lot of that innovation comes from these small businesses as well that drive very crucial economic growth in smaller regions of the country. So now instead of giving people a public option where with a, with a higher minimum wage and a lot of benefits that they would naturally be attracted to, you're now giving them money and now they can work for a small business to supplement that income. Right. Now, the other big thing when talking about a UBI is that we, as we've already mentioned, that we are going to be transitioning to automation. And so because of that, setting up a UBI is way better than going for a jobs guarantee. Is that we see that a jobs guarantee is an antiquated solution for a new 21st century problem. It's a 20th century solution for a 21st century problem, right? Exactly. And so what we're seeing is that because, you know, AI, drones, robots, and things like that are taking on more and more unskilled work, the idea of paying humans to do low skilled labor or make work jobs looks more and more antiquated. It's not really worth spending your money on anymore, is it? We see that even though we might not be there yet, that's what we're heading towards. And we have to make sure that we're ready for a world like that. And building a massive army of laborers at the start of a massive decline in the need for labor has no make sense. There's like two impacts. Number one is it's going to accelerate it, right? Because you're going to be driving up the wage, driving up, effectively driving up minimum wage, which is not necessarily a bad thing at all, but you're going to be pushing people toward doing more automation, whereas a UBI doesn't do that at all. I mean, people can take whatever jobs you want. But number two is this idea that we're going to start building this army of labor at the very point in our history as a species when, when human labor gets less and less important. And you might want to have some statistics about just how many jobs are going to be displaced. We'll probably drop one or two in there, but like when we're going to have these jobs displaced anyway, creating a massive millions and millions strong army of human labor at a time when we're going to see those falling off anyway, just seems really backwards and retrograde, right? Yeah, and the other thing it does is that now it frees up people to do other things that they want, and it also severs the link between work and your dignity, yeah. and it better upholds your own self-respect and value as a human being. Yeah. So instead of saying in a, under a jobs guarantee that, hey, you know, we're going to give you work, you're, you're going to work, and that that's, that that's an essential function of being a human being, you're now allowing people to go out and invest and explore and do what they want to do and use their time in a better way. I mean, presumably this program is going to be around for decades, right? And so 50 years from now, when we have most manual laborers done by machines of some sort, are we still going to have people out there doing things like what Normal describes, which is like digging ditches by hand when there's a robot that can come in and do it, you know, like that? Um, it, that seems silly. It seems a lot more intuitive that we would give them a UBI and let them go do something creative. Like, you know, do something only a human could do. Start a YouTube channel, right? Uh, write, write the great American novel, right? Uh, start up a place where you cook really interesting, innovative food, something like that, as opposed to having them imitate something that a machine can do a lot better. And it just seems like we're heading down the exact wrong road than what we ought to be heading down by doing a jobs guarantee over a UBI. And that actually leads to another potential net benefit of UBIs, which is that there's a lot of literature out there. We've talked about this in a prior video about them, 
uh, that, that shows that there are net benefits, like net mental health benefits and net other benefits from uh, the use of a UBI. So for example, the Great Smoky Mountain study of youth in 1993 found that net cash transfers reduced behavioral disorders by 26.7% of a standard deviation and increased conscientiousness by 42.8% of a standard deviation. Uh, reduces drug and alcohol consumption and all of these other things. Uh, we look at pilot projects for UBIs in places like Malawi, right, and we see that 38% of schoolgirls are less likely to suffer psychological distress and all of these other empirically proven things where a UBI frees people up to pursue things that they want to pursue in life. I don't believe, I may be wrong about this, but I don't believe we have an empirical body of research on a jobs guarantee because you really don't see effectively implemented jobs guarantees most in most places. So we can point to an actual body of research that shows that uh, cash transfers and UBIs have net positive effects that we can't yet demonstrate for a jobs guarantee. So it may be that that's another reason why uh, a UBI would be a better alternative. Now, to tackle the problem of climate change, as you've already talked about with the jobs guarantee, we can see that a UBI, in addition to providing all these benefits individually, would also better address climate change because it would slow down the need for constant economic growth and allow us to better combat the effects of climate change. So instead of you know having the argument that jobs uh, that, that 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 a jobs guarantee achieves higher economic growth. As a neg, you can come out and say that that's actually bad for us because the only way to fight climate change is to slow down growth and contain economic activity to only what we need, not have unlimited growth into the far future. So like one thing I might say to an app, if, especially if the app said we tried to run both A, we're going to have faster economic growth, and B, we're going to do all this climate change stuff, is how do you reconcile those two? How can you possibly argue that we're going to have dramatic you know, economic growth and also this climate change benefit? And there are ways that you can say that, right? But generally speaking, rapid you know, economic growth is something that's fundamentally in tension. Like th there's an idea of controlling growth, like slow growth. You know? And more specifically, there's this idea that a UBI would, allow p would, would keep people from having to get up in the morning, get in the car, drive out to the construction site, work on the bridge using the big heavy equipment, you know, come back home in the car, right? And all the things that contribute to the cycle of climate change, right? It would allow allow people to, for example, you know, stay home if they choose to, right? Stay home if, if, if they don't think it's worth going out and, and, and working, you know, on a construction site or something along and those lines. And I'm sure lines. you can pull up statistics about how when people stayed home during COVID-19, yeah. the effects on climate were actually way better than what we were doing before. Yeah, there's no question about that. I mean, you can look back, uh, there were, I remember pictures of places uh, from like India, like, like places uh, in cities where they said, oh, the smog cleared up for the first time in years over the city and in China and places like that. The ozone that. layer got repaired, yeah. you know, things so, like that. So there's a fundamental tension between getting everybody out working on these public works projects and you know fixing the environment which I think is important even if you don't win this point I think it's important that you push back with this you know on the idea that we're going to have this this Green New Deal solution everything the other the other answer to that of course is that you can't guarantee that the jobs will be used for the Green New Deal anyway they could they'll be used for whatever the government wants to use them for so uh, that's all I've got on uh, we've got on on universal basic income keep in mind there are some other options for counter plans that are different from that uh, uh, there's also the idea of job training program. There's statistics out there that show that we've actually got almost as many unfilled jobs in the United States as we do unemployed people. And the reason they're not filled is not because they don't exist, it's because we're not training people to meet them. So rather than sending people out to go do you know, unnecessary make work jobs, why don't we instead take the money we would have spent on that and have a massive you know, Marshall Plan type thing to train them to do the work that we actually need, to go and learn how to code, to learn how to do you know, a, a labor like you know, be a plumber, be an electrician, things along those lines. Uh, if we've already got the jobs and we've already got the need, then why should we go make more unnecessary jobs? Why don't we focus on filling the needs that we have, right? And so those are some other potential alternatives, right? Um, so that's really all I've got on the negative. You got anything else? No, I think that I think that covers it all. all. Right. So I think at the end of the day, it's a pretty evenly balanced resolution, especially if you're coming with a good alternative and you know how to defend a universal basic income. So with that, let's move and do a few quick final thoughts. Okay. So final thoughts for me are really quick. Uh, it's a good topic. It provides a lot of different angles, like I said, economic, policy, theoretical. Um, to really master it, you're going to have to spend a lot of time and get in there, write your blocks, you know, do the reading, get your head around things that are not just in your own case. Don't go into the round having only written your own case. It's going to be tough for you if you do that, right? So you've got to spend time understanding the economic theory. You've got to spend time understanding the different policy proposals. And there's no substitute for actually just doing that work. 
the, the only other point I really have is that you have to be able to sort of tell a coherent story apart from just reading your cards, right? You have to be able to explain why we're going to see economic growth in the private sector if you're on the AF, right, as a result of a jobs guarantee, how it's going to stimulate the private economy by smoothing it out. And that's a complicated story to tell. Like, we've had trouble telling it effectively even in a two-hour video. So you really have to work on being able to sell that narrative because there are so many different angles that you can have on this. But if you do those two things, if you put in the work and you really wrapped your brain around it, not just reading cards, but being able to really say it extemporaneously to the judge, you're going to have a big advantage over people who, again, just read that one article I mentioned at the beginning of the AF and came in and just copied whatever they said there. So, The only thing I have for with my final thoughts are that understand how the plans and the ideas clash. Because it's important to show that not only do you understand what you're putting forth, but you also understand what your opponent is going to be coming back with. And, right. and how your plan, or like your position, outweighs what the opponent is talking about. Get into the nuances about the details of how uh, growth isn't necessarily good with climate change and other things like that, which will better help you not only round out your case, but also effectively refute your opponents. So with that, um, we've, uh, we're one more topic in, halfway through, I guess, for Lincoln Douglas, the 2020-21 uh, the school year. So hope you guys have a great time. We will see you back here uh, the beginning of the new year. Maybe in some places, some people might start going to real regular tournaments at some point. Who knows? Uh, but either way, we'll be here doing more resolution analysis and that sort of thing. So until then, we will close with the same thing we close with every time, which is remember, debate is for everybody. So work hard, have fun, and hail state.